Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining the latest installment of the monthly Dataversity webinar series, Advanced Analytics with William McKnight. Today, William will be discussing the world in 2045. What has artificial intelligence created? Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights of questions via Twitter using hashtag ADV Analytics. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen for that feature. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speaker for the series, William McKnight. William has advised many of the world's best-known organizations, his strategies form the information management plan for leading companies in numerous, numerous industries. He is a prolific author and a popular keynote speaker and trainer. He has performed dozens of benchmarks on leading database, data lake, streaming, and data integration products. William is the number one global inf influencer in data warehousing and master data management, and he leads the Knight Consulting Group, which has twice placed in the incorporated 5,000 list. William, hello and welcome. Hello and thank you, Shannon. Welcome, everybody. Welcome back to those of you who make us a monthly stop. This is a monthly series, but today is going to be very different than the rest of the series. I'm really excited about today. Thank you, Shannon, for letting me uh, broaden the scope a little bit of advanced analytics here. Today, I'm going to be talking about the world in 2045, which is conveniently 25 years out from now. And given the year we just had, or still having, um, I think many people are looking to the future. That far in the future, I'm not sure, but that's where I'm looking. And I have found that artificial intelligence is really going to be highly impactful into that world of the future. And we're in for some change. And I uh, will move on here. I've been introduced, so I'll move along here. Yes, our company has strategy training and implementation in all areas of enterprise data. And uh, one thing that started my fascination with the future is, well, one, I intend to be around in it, <laughs> at least for some of it, um, hopefully to 2045, um, but also because I feel like with my consulting that I'm actually future-proofing my clients in many ways, and I'm thinking about the future as I think about what they need to do. And I think a lot of uh, people out there are thinking kind of the same way. It's really a, a hobby of mine. And um, well, given the year that we've just had, uh, 2020, it, is, it has been difficult putting this together to not overweight the present, uh, to not overweight what has happened this year, the virus. There's certainly, for example, there's certainly no reason to believe that the virus is the start of a continual series of viruses that we encounter. Uh, should it happen in the next 25 years? Yeah. It, probably will. Uh, we look back at things like the Black Death and Spanish flu, and, and I'm just grateful that the, the outcome of this one, at least for uh, an individual basis for most of us, is not as terminal as those were. Uh, now, if the virus were to be prolonged, that would certainly be a factor that would weigh into the future. And there are many of them, actually, many factors, I'm going to go over them, that would weigh on, on the future and probably drag back drag back a lot of the advancements that, I, if, you, if you call them advancements, that I am suggesting that we're going to have. Similarly, with the election, uh, we the march of history is there regardless of who won this election, and that will be, that weighs in way more heavily into what's going to happen in 2045. Now, as I move into some of these predictions, I am not going to burden this presentation by stopping every minute and saying, well, you know what, I believe this prediction about 50%, or I believe this prediction about 75%. Suffice it to say, I don't know the future. I am just predicting here, and I probably believe most of these on the order of about 50 to 75%. But again, I'm not going to stop and say that at every turn. Um, and I'm also not going to stop and give you a probability distribution about each one of these things. Like, for example, driverless cars. There's full driverless. There's semi-driverless, there's going to be some driverless and some not, and 
So there's all sorts of distribution about it. But I'm going to try to hit it right down the middle where I think it's going to be. And I'm not going to bother with the probability distribution because I have a lot of content here today to share with you. And as I think about the content of the future, everything really is influenced by artificial intelligence. Now, for those of you who know, uh, I really am talking about machine learning, but the more broader term here is AI. I'm going to use that. I believe AI is going to replace a lot of the places that we in business use business intelligence. And so where there is BI, there can be AI, and that means a lot. It means a lot more capabilities as we're going to see. Now, I get asked a lot because people know I'm, I'm looking at the future. Um, is it going to be better? That's kind of a bottom line question people ask when they have about 10 seconds to absorb the information. And, I really don't know how to answer that question. Um, in some ways, I suppose it could be better. In some ways, you might say it's worse. But however it's going to be, keep in mind, we're going to have 25 years to build up to that. We're going to have 25 years of, of more incremental progress than, you know, how it's exactly going to be in 2045. So, uh, you know, we're going to survive. We're going to enjoy uh, it as we can. And uh, here's, a, here's a question for you. I want you to think about this as we go along. Would you want to wake up from a coma in 2045? So in other words, if you, when you go to your uh, cryotherapy today, let's say it goes really long and you get frozen and uh, you get to wake up in 25 years, would you want to do that? Is it going to be better for you? Well, I'm not so sure about that. I'm not so sure that if that ha were to happen to me or you that we wouldn't wake up and be kind of put into what uh, what might be a the, the zoo of the future or the, the museum of the future. We might be so far behind uh, the way things are. And I see a very indulgent future for us. And, and by that, I would mean that the citizens of that time may just not care so much about us coming out of our, of our comas and so on. But that's just me. You, know, you might look at this and go, uh, I would like that. I would like to jump into that future. So let's get into it. And by the way, I am not advocating this future. I'm not sitting here cheerleading this future. I'm not saying, oh, I can't wait for this and that to, to occur. I'm simply trying to look at it scientifically and say, this is what I see happening. I will save my advocacy for a, a better future, which uh, is, is, um, is, 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 Fundamental, uh, the fundamental of that is to eliminate suffering. I will save my advocacy there for a future date, or a future date. How do you like that? Okay. Now, the macro factors are go of the future are going to play hard. I can't stress this enough. Before I get into predictions, um, I, I have to say there's a lot of reasons why this future won't come about. There's a lot of existential risk. There may be alien invasion. <laughs> That's very unlikely, but there are some risks that are much more likely, like nuclear war or asteroid impacts. Uh, they come to mind. Probably the nuclear war has the higher probability here. Uh, also, if major companies adopt uh, totalitarian governments, that would also be a factor to bend this progress more towards the state and less towards the individual. So as I say these things, I am thinking about, well, or maybe you're thinking about who is going to receive these, these benefits, if you will, who's going to be able to take advantage of, of this artificial intelligence. And um, yes, it will start kind of at the top, like a lot of things. I see it's very bifurcated, perhaps even more so than, than uh, the way things are doled out today. So there could very well be citizens that get to be, get to take on a full advantage of, of these future capabilities and a whole slew of society that is left behind. And so as I say these things that are going to happen, I don't necessarily mean that everybody in the world is going to enjoy them, um, unfortunately. So uh, that is something that I think we really do need to look out for. But again, I'm going to kind of hold back on the advocacy side of things for today. Now, there are other existential risks that could play in, like a water crisis, uh, like the fact that oil is a non-renewable resource, and it is yet to be determined how we as a species will handle the fact that our number one uh, energy source is uh, slowing down, let's say. Um, there, is, there are hopeful signs around renewable energy, 
and perhaps the and I'm going to I'm going to be putting several things out there uh, for you today that I watch and I hope you maybe find some interest in watching as well. These are barometers of the future as far as I'm concerned. And one of them I'll say is the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor. And this is an international nuclear fusion research and engineering mega project. And it is an experimental fusion reactor being built in province, southern France. Something to keep your eye on. Uh, many, uh, 35 nations of the world are involved in this. And this is um, trying to solve the, the major problem with renewables today, which is around uh, the ability to store and, and use energy in the future. So whether we, I don't know how far we're going to get to, we are going to run off the cliff in terms of uh, our use of oil. I don't know that it will happen in the next 25 years, and I don't know how close we'll get before we slow anything down, which we really haven't done much of. I think uh, the, the hope is that renewable comes on the scene. And okay, so that's an existential risk that would definitely impact some of the things that we have to say here because the things I have to say here largely do use energy. So the energy must be there for it. There are definitely a lot of good hopeful signs about the future. I think for one, I think racism is going to be something that in 2045 is going to be far less prevalent uh, when a larger percentage and it's growing exponentially, a larger percentage of the world is indeed multiracial. By that time, it should be around somewhere in the 30 to 40 percent. It's going to be hard to be uh, a racist, uh, a little bit harder to be a racist at that point in time. And by the way, as I get into some of these, I do not mean to insult any of you, and I do not mean to insult any of your worldviews out there, because some of you have worldviews that probably mean that some of these things of the future just will not happen and cannot happen because they do not fit your worldview. And that's fine. I respect that. I'm just sharing with you some of this information about where things are headed. Now, if you look back at, 19, at the 1990s, that was our 25-year-ago point right now. Actually, that was 30 years ago. But in the 90s, uh, look how far we've come. Look how far we've come from the 1990s. This is a computer I worked on back then, the Mac 2 FX. It only cost my company $10,000 in dollars back then, and uh, that excluded the monitor. <laughs> and I have more power today in my pocket in my smartphone than I did on that computer there. And also consider we didn't get the web until the early 90s, and it took a while before it became like really popular as well. So these are some things that came on the scene 25, 30 years ago, and the pace of change has only gone up exponentially. So certainly with some of the things I'm about to say, um, they make sense in that context, but only if you consider that kind of context. Now I'm going to take a rapid look at 2045 here over the next three slides, and then I'm going to step back to right now, 2020, and tell you about some of the things that are going, that's going on now that I'm using to make these projections into 2045. So quickly on the projections for now for 2045, our planet will be a vastly different place. Artificial intelligence will be everywhere. AI-driven stores will allow you to shop without cashiers or waiting lines. AI will diagnose and treat patients, manage transportation, and analyze all relevant quantities of data that apply to that situation in real time. AI chatbots, and voice recognition systems will sound like people. AI will be implemented in robots galore. Robot dogs and other pets will serve as companion robots for elderly, for lonely, for sick, uh, et cetera, people. And by the way, the, the next several slides are going to be pretty slide intensive. Oh, and by the way, here's my, uh, here's my four furry friends. And they just think this is a horrible idea. They don't get a vote. Okay, so sensors. AI will dominate factories and begin to serve as teachers, cooks, anything that is sort of factory eyes, anything that, that is uh, cookbook oriented. In other words, uh, if you're doing things that are kind of off a list, kind of wrote things, uh, that has definite uh, potential for change. And a, a lot of people, when, I, when we talk about the future, we, we think about our jobs, right? I'm gonna hit our job situation uh, toward the end of this presentation. There is profound impact, though, on jobs of the future. Uh, pharmacists, law enforcement officers, athletes, and other professionals are definitely going to be highly impacted by AI. When it comes to athletes, when it comes to 
musicians, actors, things of that nature. Uh, and I'm going to talk about gene splicing a little bit later. I think that's going to heavily weigh into the the human uh, the human being's design. Um, it's that that's all going to start before birth, um, and it's just not going to be possible for uh, a pro for someone to be a professional athlete uh, unless they get pre-birth uh, benefits uh, toward that end. And so it's going to be that kind of arms race, um, I'm afraid. I don't know if this will uh, tear back some of the value of sports. Again, I think we're going to want to warm into it year by year, so maybe not. Universal translators will remove all language barriers. Hundreds of sensors will be installed in our clothes, homes, and overall environment to monitor us. And I think monitoring is going to be a huge part uh, of our future. Uh, the doctor will see you now. Well, which doctor? Computing is going to change, and um, we may be running on quantum computers based upon the properties of quantum physics. AI and computers will integrate into human friendships, like Elon Musk Neuralink. Can, could you be friends with a computer? Could you be friends with a robot? Uh, I know, in, you know, the knee-jerk knee reaction is, no way, I couldn't. But I'm going to show you some things, and, and maybe you really can. AI is going to treat neurological disorders like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, spiral cord injury. I believe in 2045, these things will be largely in the rearview mirror, blindness and deafness as well, and robot prosthetics may be stronger and more advanced than our own biological ones. No, I'm not going to, no, I don't foresee me clamoring to have my arm chopped off for one of these things, but if it happens that way, um, you can uh, rest assured that uh, in the future, the prosthetics are going to be better. People to control computers and prosthetics with no physical interaction tapping into our brain more and more is what's going to happen over the next 25 years. We're going to be figuring it out. We're going to use DNA and genome research to figure that out and actually control things with our minds, control computers with our minds. Virtual reality will be everywhere. People will try on clothes in virtual reality closets. We will virtually be able to travel the world and experience life on other planets and all places on the Earth. But now let's come back to the present. The present. Now, it may sound like I'm talking about the future here, but I'm talking about the present, the modern day. And uh, it's probably five o'clock somewhere. So let's start out talking about whiskey. All right. I've learned a little bit here. Whiskey, uh, there are so many variables that go into the making of whiskey, more than 70 million different recipes uh, out there and then growing, of course. So what AI can do is take all these variables out of some whiskeys and determine the appropriate uh, best of the best, if you will, blend of those variables, which include things like how long it stays in the cask, what the cask held before, uh, and all this that makes up a specific recipe. But all the things that master distillers tweak today and hope for the best, uh, there are whiskeys now that are made by artificial intelligence. So what about this painting in the upper right here? You like that painting? Pretty nice, huh? That's Edmund de Bellamy, not a real person. But it's a 2018 painting created using a type of artificial intelligence algorithm called the Generative Adversarial Network. And uh, simply, uh, the AI was fed different paintings of profiles of people, and it figured it out. And this painting sold for $432,500. So that got my attention a little bit here. Now, have you heard any AI music lately? Let me play a little bit of this for you, a few bars. Okay, I just wanted it to get to the point where you, you heard that there were some lyrics uh, there. There's a lot of AI generated music. Um, unfortunately, a lot of unfortunately, a lot of the music of the future is definitely going to be influenced by AI music and lyrics, well, if not outright written completely by AI. Now today, it's not that's not too different from today if you think about it. That there's a couple of guys in Sweden that write most of the top pop tunes, and that's actually a fact. So uh, check that out. But now they, those two might lose their job. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, unfortunately, yeah, I said it again, the mass of humanity is probably about 10 years behind the possibilities. They don't believe, if you ask the common person on the street, they don't believe cars can drive themselves. They don't believe 
that they have vulnerabilities that can be exploited. They don't believe in the depth of manipulation science, and they constantly overestimate their own uh, of, uh, their own abilities. Um, they don't understand the range of humanity as well. And I'm not saying I do either, by the way. Uh, humans just aren't aren't really geared to knowing all this. They're not going to believe what they see as fake. We're going through a time period here in the next 25 years, probably in the next 10 years. I expect it to ramp up pretty quickly where we are going to be subject to a lot of fakery. And hopefully uh, this audience all knows what a deep fake is. Jump ahead a little bit here. Someone Very. Else, someone. I want you to hear a few bars there. Very, uh, very convincing. Deep fakes are very convincing. Uh, and they're, they are not that difficult to do. Now, have you met Sophia? This is Sophia. Sophia is a robot. She is a full fledged citizen of Saudi Arabia. And she is famous for saying, I have feelings too. Well, now, does she have feelings really? Well, maybe she does. She has thousands of markers of human emotion, and they go up and down based upon the stimuli that she is receiving at that moment uh, and um, the accumulation of stimuli over the course of her quote unquote life. So does she have feelings? Well, if you count that as feelings, she has feelings. Now, here's some more things. Uh, this is a face with several data points uh, pointed out on this face. Did you know that you have a unique face? And I have a unique face. And those, and because of that, uh, we can be identified by our faces. And so, uh, by looking at these various data points and the distances between them, the depth and so on, uh, human faces can be easily determined now and recreated. And so this is why I tell my daughter, don't do this. Don't do like this, this young lady at the football game here. It didn't go her way at the very end. And <laughs> she decided to express her, uh, this is off my television set, by the way. She decided to express her, uh, uh, disapproval of uh, the game here. But, uh, and this is obviously very benign, but obviously it goes downhill from here. So uh, let's be careful with uh, the pictures that we're associated with because I can definitely see, I definitely believe that now many employers are turning to third parties that do deep web research and uh, do, do look for the candidate's face uh, everywhere that it possibly can be. So we want to be careful about that. Now there was a movie in uh, 2019 called uh, The Irishman. Maybe some of you saw that, but in that movie, they de-aged the stars, Robert De Niro, Al Pacino, and Joe Pesci. They made them appear 40 years younger, and they spent millions and millions of dollars doing this, and it took an awfully long time. Well, let's cut forward to 2020. A YouTube deepfaker did a better job at it with free software and just seven days of work. It's that easy now to de-age or probably add age to individuals' pictures. And just when I, and by the way, I, I mentioned at the beginning that I think the mass of humanity is 10 years behind the possibilities, doesn't really know about deep fakes, but also off my television, uh, this is a, a football star here, and he said that this is deep fake Saquon Barkley. And so maybe the by using it on the television like that, people are gonna hear it and look into it a little bit more and hopefully become more informed citizens about what's going on out there so they're not fooled so much. Now, all these bastions of, of what you might be thinking are, you know, well, these are bastions of humanity. Only humanity can do these things, like reading. One by one, they're getting knocked down. And I don't need to belabor how uh, computers win at Jeopardy when it's a very complex game of Go, but it goes well beyond that. Uh, robots can now read better than humans. Uh, there is an artificial intelligence algorithm that has outperformed humans in reading comprehension tests. And the algorithm was developed by Chinese retail giant Alibaba. It outscored humans in the Stanford question answering data set, a global reading test consisting of more than 100,000 questions. The result could have a significant impact in introducing the technology into roles typically performed by, yeah, humans. So you think about all human frailties, uh, we get tired, um, there are times of day we're just not not in the mood for great reading and comprehension and so on. Uh, none of this with computers, and they can do it at a much faster rate. We just have to expose them to the information, and we're increasingly doing that. And I'm going to tell you about one such project 
that uh, was an eye opener for me anyway in a few slides here. Now, what about designing all this? Okay, we think, okay, there's reading, there's all these things that computers can do, but, you know, how about put, but putting it all together to do great things? That's got to be really difficult. That's got to require humans. Well, I don't know. Google's new AI designs AI better than humans could. And I've spoken previously on this series about auto ML, auto machine learning. And as some of you know, there are dozens of algorithms uh, associated with machine learning. And picking the right one is key to the effectiveness of the program. And that can be difficult. That can be a challenge, and that can be something that, well, if you're limited in your knowledge, you may not be picking the best one. But AutoML gets around that by picking the best one for us using an approach called reinforcement learning. So it auto-selects the algorithms. Now, if it's auto-selecting the algorithms, how much more is there to many enterprise projects between it, algorithms and data? And we'll talk a little bit more about data as we go along here. But I think that comprises a lot of the bulk of enterprise projects. Now, here's something I'm going to spend a few slides on because this is one of the major green shoots out there, I think, in terms of the, a barometer for the future, and that's uh, GPT-3. Hopefully you've heard about this, something you want to put on your radar. This language prediction model was created by San Francisco startup OpenAI, and this is co-founded by Elon Musk. His name is associated with several of these things. Uh, just imagine an AI that can write anything. You feed it a poet, and it will write some poetry that seemingly comes straight from that poet's uh, uh, pen. Uh, same with lyrics, same with painting pictures, same with music, same with a lot of things, cooking, all right? Any, anytime you can, anytime it boils down to data, GPT-3 is on that, it's on that case. It was trained on billions, hundreds of billions, excuse me, of words and cookbooks, Wikipedia, and the general web, which includes coding. The training data is all encompassing. It doesn't require you to show the training for specific language tasks. In other words, it can apply what is learned to many things without human intervention at all. For example, let's say I'm giving it the sentence, I want to go to the gym, so I went to get my blank. Well, that blank can be filled with a lot of things. There are countless possibilities, but it knows that a good thing to fill in there might be shoes. That might be better than piano, for example. And uh, in September of 2020, Microsoft announced that it had license to the exclusive use of GPT-3. And the public can still use it to receive output, but only Microsoft has control the source code, controls the source code. So in the next few slides, let's dive into GPT-3 a little bit. How about a song lyrics generator? Uh, if you want a country song, okay, let's do country. We can do any genre, really. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, I don't listen to country, but uh, reads like maybe a country song would. Uh, some pretty creative, interesting lyrics here. And uh, it also gives you an album cover and so on. Ready to go, ready to go, ready to be packaged and put out there. How about journalism? Journalism is definitely in the crosshairs of artificial intelligence. Journalism uh, is the writing of news, and AI can write news, it can write computer code in any language. And as you can see here, Microsoft sacks journalists to replace them with robots. There's a lot of that going on. I think um, we, we probably all would be surprised at how much of the things we read uh, were actually written by uh, computers, written by artificial intelligence. For example, here's, here's something that this guy, said to GPT-3 how to run an effective board meeting. He scribbled it out, he wrote it up, he thought it was good, gave it to GPT-3, and GPT-3 GPT came back with a three-step process and put it in much better words than he could. And uh, I took out his curse words, but other than that, um, he is expressing how surprised he is and how valuable that was, and he's actually going to use it what GPT-3 came up with. This is today. A college student used GPT-3 to write fake blog posts and ended up at the top of Hacker News. They were so good. And he didn't even write it. He just used GPT-3. How about building a machine learning model just by describing a data set and required output? No coding required? Yes. 
So there are many risks to this, of course. It's, it's only as good as the data that comes in. So this brings up an, an important point, especially today. What if, uh, what if the GPT-3 is absorbing fake news or what if it's absorbing misleading news or just plain wrong stuff? Well, I think GPT-3 GPT has to write AI to figure out that it is absorbing that information. But then what about the people behind the misinformation? Maybe it's, it's how do they figure out that GPT-3 or other forms of AI is figuring out that they are writing fake news? Well, they have to write some AI to do that. See, we'll get into an arms war, and I think the next 25 years are going to be that AI arms war. Arms war. How about Einstein? Would you like to talk to Einstein, either by text or uh, verbally? I think I would. I think it'd be very interesting. Uh, you can do that now with many historical figures. And uh, this, you may find this to be more interesting than talking to your Aunt Mabel. No uh, offense to Aunt Mabel's out there, but uh, this just seems really interesting to be able to talk to these people of history. Now, what about fake people? Now, here I don't mean people that pretend to be something that they're not. <laughs> these are not real people. And uh, the, again, GPT-3, trained to create fake people using a database of 70,000 photos of real humans. All these humans you see, like this lady, is fake. And you can just generate them all day long, and you would not know the difference. That is for sure. Um, and then in the lower right, you see, generate a Latino female with medium length hair, blah, 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 blah. Uh, obviously, the pictures there are not that, but they're from an earlier query, but you get the idea. Again, how do you know that a person you're looking at, a picture you're looking at, is, is a fake person? Well, you have to write some AI for that. And then, okay, on the other side, the AI has to outwit your AI so that truth wins out somehow, if you care. If you care, maybe you won't care in the future. The sad part is people who still believe everyone is like them and will be just completely fooled by those who uh, want to fool them. Uh, believing that everybody is like you, that, you know, don't lie, you don't lie, you don't mislead and all the news is real, and it's for our own good, and et cetera, et cetera. That's a dangerous position to hold today. All right, GPT-3 can simplify. Here's a complex, big paragraph. GPT-3 made it short and simple. And uh, I like short and simple, at least uh, as I wade into a new topic. So it would be great to read the short and simple before I dive into the details in GPT-3 can do that for us. It understands objects. Now we're getting into the other part of AI other than machine learning, and that's natural language processing. So Facebook has open source M2M100, which is an AI model that can translate between over 100 languages. Microsoft has detailed an algorithm of its own, the Turing Universal Language Representation, with 550 million parameters or internal variables that the model leverages to make predictions. So it can do what you see here in any language and at great depth, well beyond human depth. So what can you do with something like cookie dough? You can roll it, knead it, cut it, shape it or bake it. And there's a limited set of things you can do with it or you should be doing with cookie dough, right? Um, so does it know what it's saying? Does it understand what it's doing? Well, in a recursive sense, it does. So does it know what roll means? Well, it can go look that up, you see and figure out with words what that means, uh, kind of like what we do. Does it have common sense? Well, the Turing test is another thing to keep an eye on. A lot of things will be comparing themselves to the Turing test in the next 25 years. So what is the Turing test? It's a test of a machine's ability to exhibit intelligent behavior equivalent to or indistinguishable from that of a human. Okay, so this is GPT-3 here once again, answering these questions correctly. Okay, I think healthcare is going to be a high priority for the use of artificial intelligence. I've already alluded to some of that. It's going to get it's going to get down to our genome though. It's going to have uh, it's going to create a very personalized healthcare for us. And uh, it's all going to come from our genome because guess what? Everything is there. Everything is there in our genome. Uh, what we're going how we we will respond to anything is there. Now of course we are continually uh, growing and have experiences every day that affect us, but that all is, that's all a factor 
of our genome. I hope I'm saying this well. So if we know our collective genome, we have complete knowledge of everything that's going to happen, collective genome of all living things, because we have to consider the environment, uh, animals as well, because they obviously also impact um, the stimuli that we are going to receive, that we need to react to. So right now, where you'll be tomorrow is in the cards somewhere. We don't know them, though. We don't, we don't see those cards. And what healthcare is going to be able to do is look in the genome, look into it early and often, and predict things uh, where they're going to be able to compare those genes to how the genes are expressed, and humans become a big data set. All right. And the, the core of that is starting here. And one of the, uh, one of the uh, early uh, signs of this is that Microsoft and Jack's labs are doing what they're doing uh, for healthcare AI. Genomic medicine researchers at the laboratory have been using AI to help manage the vast amount of research data needed to power its precision oncology initiatives. Now, this brings up, brings to mind other things. Uh, the genomic um, problems that we have, like some of the ones I've mentioned before, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, uh, and so on, uh, I think that we will be on top of that. Cancer, I don't think it'll be fully solved by 2045. I think it'll be much better treated, though, because we'll be able to see it occurring much earlier and stopping its spread. So definitely some positive uh, signs in, in terms of healthcare. Transportation, mm. boy, a lot of changes coming in in terms of transportation. This idea that we all need cars and parking and uh, it's very inefficient. And I think that's a, that's a ripe opportunity for uh, the future. Uh, I'm, I'm a big believer in self-driving cars uh, coming on strong here. We see a lot of green shoots in regards to this. Amazon acquired the auto vendor Zooks. Amazon focused more on integrating this into their distribution network. And their distribution network, by the way, is a real bell, bellwether for the future because the plans are for hovering uh, blimps, if you will, <laughs> that are warehouses above cities. Uh, Amazon is also taking over uh, some city uh, based uh, malls that are going under now as a result of COVID uh, for distribution centers, and they plan uh, a lot of drone delivery in much more real time than what we have today, believe it or not. So anyway, Alphabet is doing this as well. Alphabet, of course, Google, they have their spin out Waymo, GM has their Cruise, Uber is doing this, Tesla is doing this, Apple is doing this, uh, and they're keeping their project somewhat secretive. But for one of them, Google's project, raised $2.25 billion in outside funding in March in preparation for the long haul. Now, if you're a, a middle person, uh, you are vulnerable today. If you're a pass-through, that's not going to be enough. Manufacturers are going to be able to go direct to consumer, bypassing the middle person. Uh, we're going to be improving demand forecasting by reducing forecasting errors and reducing lost sales at very high levels. So, we're going to have a much more efficient distribution network for not only our stuff, but our people. Now, what about the bottom line for many of us? We're coders. Uh, we've, we already have things that exhibit the ability to understand code, like, for example, the Defense Advanced Project Agency, that's DARPA's Probabilistic Programming for Advanced Machine Learning, PPAML, is developing new technologies that improve machine learning. For questions, both decoder and auto ML use machine learning to produce executable code. So entire knowledge bases are being built so that it can interpret the code like it's doing here on my slide. It tells you exactly what the code is doing and so on. But what about the next big step, which is to actually create the code? Well, at the build.code code today, and uh, they're only taking beta registrants right now, um, but you can describe your app in that box, and uh, obviously this is very simple and it does it very easily, but the description can be very uh, difficult and challenging, and uh, that can be created in a much more efficient way than coding. So I think coding is right for a lot of change as well in the future, in 2045. There are a lot of risks to this. I mentioned before that, you know, the, it's only as good as the data that it receives. The AI is, that is. So there's a lot of uh, misinformation out there, a lot of fake news. I talked about the arms race. 
Uh, there's not going to be a single body that's creating all the AI. It's still going to be distributed, and, and the AI is largely going to have to be dealing with other forms of AI that are in opposition to it. Like, for example, I can see CEOs having AI uh, in the future where they can uh, turn the dial to say, hey, we want some more revenue this quarter. You know, that's what we need right now. And it happens because – the knock-on effect of that turning that down means that the activities are set in motion for that to happen. And a quarter is not a long time. That can actually happen. But are you sacrificing the future by doing that? And what about the competitor's response to that? And what about if you were to turn that uh, and say do it at all costs? Uh, would you be engaging in behavior that is, uh, is frowned upon? like racism and so on, uh, in order to achieve that end? Is that something that we want? So there's a lot of uh, ethical questions in regards to this, but I could definitely see more, more dials being, being spun up to handle business decision-making in the future, even to the point of definitely in 2045, uh, uh, algorithms will run major companies as opposed to uh, CEOs. I'm not saying all people will – step aside, but algorithms will run some companies. There will be mistakes along the way. Uh, for example, if you pour yourself a glass, if you say, you pour yourself a glass of milk, but then you accidentally pour your vitamin C powder into it. You're very thirsty, so you drink it. Now you're blank. AI today would put the word dead in there because of the way that you phrased the, uh, the sentence when you said accidentally. When you say you're actually drinking something, it knows that when you drink things, there is the potential that it kills you. And the way that you put that sentence could lead AI to, to think that the proper word there is dead. It will get better. As a matter of fact, remember this about everything I'm talking about here. It's at the worst level that will, it will ever be at right now. It's only at its lowest point right now. It's only going to get better as long as it gets fed. And I think all of these are going to get fed. And by the way, fake news today is, uh, is rampant, and we have to be diligent. And one of the rules of thumb I use is if I'm reading it, if it stirs me up, if it gets me wanting to take action and so on, it's good to take a step back. It's good to take a step back because the problem is there is algorithmic, algorithmic amplification of fake news because it stirs us up. And so that is the thing that we really need to look at today. That's a little aside. We are at the start of general AI. GPT-3, its most surprising thing to me is its applicability so many places. It's generality. And it's not alone. General AI is a, is a machine that has the capacity to understand or learn any intellectual task that a human being can. So we're at the start of computers being there. In 2045, again, I'll say, I think major corps will be run by artificial intelligence. Mark Zuckerberg has already talked about wanting dials to, uh, you know, dial up things that changes his business, and because of the business he's in, that changes humanity. He's talked about having these dials. He has the data, and I think it'll all kind of start with, with, with these dials, and we'll go from there. Um, if you say things like, yeah, I want more revenue to my business this quarter, you're sacrificing the future, potentially. Uh, you're, you're sacrificing norms. You're engaging competitors in a certain way that, you know, there will be a response. Um, business is going to become a battle of algorithms. And by 2045, that is how business will run. Now, in terms of things that affect us as people, this is very controversial, but have you heard of CRISPR? This is something that, uh, you, that I, you know, I have very high on my radar in terms of how humans are going to be in the future. So how do I want to talk about this? Because I can only do so much because I'm not a scientist in this area, of course. But I have seen this process happen uh, in plant science. I had a client in plant science. I saw the splicing of the DNA. Uh, onto the plant using bacteria. It was fascinating, and it was actually a game changer for me. It was a game changer in terms of the possibilities, and it, it really led me down this path of really caring about the future and getting into it. Um, 
seeing that process happen. And of course, what they were doing was trying to create plants that were more robust, uh, that were more um, tolerable to, uh, you know, pesticides and so forth. But, uh, you know, humans have that in spades, uh, but it is kind of a similar problem. And I don't want to get too deep into, you know, GMO and stuff like that, because essentially that's what we're talking about here, applying that concept to humans. But uh, anything that we really buy at the store today, it, it has been changed, uh, whether we like to admit that or not. We, the problem is we tend to set that point at which things are the way they're supposed to be at when we're young and when we were growing up. Um, but obviously we're all doing that at different time periods and the future generations will do that at different time periods and they'll see something different and that they'll consider the norms and so on, right? So, but most of the things that you buy at a store today uh, didn't exist as much as 200 years ago. Even the, the, the tomatoes and, and the cows, uh, the cow meat. So cows have been uh, definitely modified to do the role that we want them to do. And we're able to go out in the woods and walk among the, the trees and so on because the predators have been cleared out by who? By us. Um, there are no, I have Havanese dogs. There are no Havaneses back then. There were wolves. Genetic modification has sped all this up. It's kind of like working out in high altitude, getting ready for a race by limiting your oxygen. And only it's taking that concept and actually going right to the source and making things happen. So in 2018, a Chinese scientist sparked an international outcry after alleging to have helped create the world's first genetically edited babies. Yes, he has raised the possibility of a third child being born. I don't know if that child was born or not, but the parents both had HIV. And so he edited the, the baby to make sure that the baby would not have HIV and did this with genome editing with CRISPR. CRISPR is uh, actually the basis for um, all forms of uh, defect monitoring today. And I think by 2045, it's going to have a profound impact on, um, on society. Now, will we all look like uh, the guy in the lower right here, the Incredible Hulk? <laughs> will we be a nation of hulks? I don't know about that, but it will affect society. And the thing that will push things forward so hard and fast, even beyond the controversy, is the fact that for the next 25 years, we're going to be locked in a in a intellectual war with uh, China, and we're going to have a get there at all first mentality. What does that all have to do with AI? Yeah, it has a lot to do with AI, but I'm just trying to round out the information here and uh, say some things that uh, help put context to the, the little techn technological innovations that are going to happen. Now, I haven't been to China, but uh, I do, do believe that we are already in an arms race <clears throat> of artificial intelligence with China, and they are very technologically advanced in their innovations. Huawei just recently surpassed Apple, that's the number two cell phone manufacturer in the world. By the way, I practice saying that. You see, it's the little things that matter here at Advanced Analytics that we do for you. Uh, anyway, five years ago, they had a single-digit share of the marketplace, and now they're number two on planet Earth. I've often thought while when I'm in the gym that, well, it would be kind of interesting to see what other people are listening to on their, uh, on their uh, MP3 players. Uh, if, if there could be, like, just something kind of hovering above their head, that could create an interesting conversation piece, you know. Um, but I, but it will go well beyond that, I, I'm, I do believe. Uh, Black Mirror has an episode that I think is, is a bellwether for that future. It has uh, everybody's social score being uh, shared and so on. Uh, in China, this is starting to happen. Uh, they are advanced, in if you want to use the word advanced, in terms of being a surveillance state. I do believe that cameras are going to be everywhere by 2045, and we won't be able to step outside our homes without being on a camera. And um, as I said before, uh, we can certainly be backtracked uh, to all the places that we have been, and potentially to some of the places that we will be based upon the genome uh, research. Speaking of countries, uh, there's gonna be definitely definite changeovers in terms of countries by 2045, as there always is. Uh, there are some company, countries in financial ruin, there are separatist movements, there's North Korea, there's African nations that are nothing but at war, and coastal cities and global warming that will change the landscape of the planet. I'm gonna move along here. Modular data centers 
is next. Modular data center is a portable method of deploying data center capacity. A modular data center can be placed anywhere data capacity is needed. It can be placed in blimps, it can be placed uh, on shorelines, and there's a lot of green shoots going on in regards to that. Uh, Elon Musk's SpaceX is uh, interested in beaming uh, internet capability, not only to all places on this planet, but in terms of space travel. And they're looking at space travel to Mars, as most of us know, and NASA is doing that as well. Speaking of that, I believe that we probably will have uh, Mars landings uh, by that time. And whether we establish that, uh, and his, his goal is uh, a, a million people uh, on Mars by 2045. I don't know if we'll reach that or not, but uh, I believe that we might create an outpost there for humans, which will be interesting. Transportation, I talked a little bit about this already. The majority, majority of automobiles will be electric. Part of the problem now is the, the refueling takes so long, but I think that's something that will speed up. There'll be driverless, there'll be new fleets, not the Fords and the GMs and so on, but new fleets from like the Teslas, the Ubers, the Lyfts and so on, some of the newer uh, companies in transportation. Uh, parking is going to be something that will re repurpose space around, uh, it won't be as necessary. Uh, there will be far less uh, individual ownership of automobiles, far less need for that, and more high-speed traffic like trains that go 700 miles per hour, supersonic aircraft that can get us anywhere on the planet in an hour. Uh, Elon Musk is uh, famously uh, talking about starships from New York to London in 29 minutes. Yeah. So uh, in the, these driverless fleets, I don't see them having steering wheels. Uh, I don't see that as being necessary. And if you look at a factory today, or a, I should say a distribution center today, like ones that, Am that Amazon has, it's, it's a lot of robots moving product around. They don't run into each other. They sense each other. And so I think that's a little microcosm of what our streets could be like in the year 2045. How about our diet? Well, one of the things that is, uh, is sitting there looming at us is our consumption of meat. I think real meat is going to turn to something that's on the down low, something that's going to be off menu. Uh, it's just impossible to use a word here. <laughs> it's just impossible to continue uh, the way that it has. Uh, we will find better ways like what Impossible Meats is doing, Impossible Foods is doing now, and their rival Beyond Burger and many others are creating that burger-like uh, food, which I like. It's, it's a cultured meat, uh, indoor, vertical, city-based farms for that. I think we're going to have drones uh, all over the place, floating or vertical warehouses delivering packages urban for our urban transportation. It will be uh, drones as well as the electric cars. Airbus has, is going to have a drone-like pop-up concept. Elon Musk today has uh, the boring comp company and uh, he has uh, that company has bored I think it's two miles of roadway under the city of Las Vegas right now uh, and he he is buying into that concept and believes that that is going to be uh, the roadways of our future so to be determined on that I'm not so sure about that uh, but that is a concept that we're going down right now to have roadways under our city streets Cameras and audio recording everywhere. Cameras will be invisible, practically. I mean, we won't be able to notice them. Your profile will be evident, though. And AI will decide our fates. Uh, that sounds very luminous, and or ominous, I should say, and threatening. But uh, a lot of the stimuli that's going to be presented to us is going to be as a result of AI and as a result of where we are. Now, there are going to be challenges along the way like today when soccer is displayed, soccer games are, are projected on the television, the cameras follow the ball so that we're always seeing what the action is around the ball. But uh, in this particular case, this referee with his bald head um, was followed the whole time uh, in lieu of the ball <laughs> because the artificial intelligence mistook his bald head for a soccer ball. So there will be mistakes along the way. Yeah. Okay. Now, to our job situation. Top trends in enterprise analytics. Uh, our, my usual um, 
followers on this series uh, work in this space. And I think that some of the things we're going to see is data is going to be on the balance sheet. It's a tremendous asset to the company. It's finally going to break that barrier and be on the asset sheet. I mean, the rules for data being on the balance sheet, it's there now. It's an internally created asset. There's a corresponding cost for acquiring or building this asset. There is a depreciation cycle. That's a little bit more difficult to figure out, but there is. And it's utilized in a similar manner across companies. Those are the rules. So it should be on the balance sheet, and it will be on the balance sheet by 2045. There will be an explosion in everything at the edge. So the idea of centralized computing, uh, the idea of everything having to come back centralized because of space and computing capacity limitations will be gone, and we will have strong edge AI and hybrid databases, databases that uh, are for both operational and analytical. And this is really a key here, I think. William, William. Yes. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. I just want to let you know where we have five minutes left in the. Webinar. Five minutes. Left. Yes, I've been watching and, and speeding up here. <laughs> we'll continue to do so, but this is key. All right. Upon data creation, the need to store data will be reduced. Companies will operate with millions of key variables updated with each new data point. So that will automatically execute the automatic, the, the proper next best action. It's going to be determined by AI. We're not going to need to explain it. So over the next decades, it's going to be the brain computer interface, natural language inputs, AI voice assistance, and Google like chat box. Catalogs today, our data catalogs today are becoming self learning. So the idea of the data analyst sitting there looking at data and determining what we need to do about it, that is what I am saying is something that will be in the in our rearview mirror by then. The vast majority of data jobs will be automated. Yeah, yeah. Data discovery, auto generated pipelines based upon global experiences, not simply our own. Joins by data and context. And AI will trounce BI. We won't have BI anymore, we won't be having to store all this data because as soon as the data occurs, it's going to update all of the markers for our company, as I mentioned on the earlier slide, the key variables, and those key variables are what's going to be used to determine the next best actions of the business. So there's going to be definitely work behind the scenes at building out the AI, but the analysis of that data can be automated. Which brings me to my final slide, our relationship with work. Work is going to be profoundly impacted by artificial intelligence. I know there's always something every generation that, that raises the foundation and eliminates some of the manual work. It's going to happen in spades over the next 25 years. Our need to work as a species is going to be less. We need a new relationship to work. We need a new ethos because if we continue with the same ethos of everybody must work to be a contributor, you know, 40 hours a week to be a contributing member of society, it, that's just not going to be possible in the year 2045. But in getting there over the next couple of decades, we're going to have a lot of pain in this regard because we're going to hang tight to our former ethos and um, people are just going to go through a lot of pain as a result of not, they're not being the jobs that there used to be. There will be transition. There will be uh, some bouncing from uh, of certain people, but a lot of people are just unable to, to cope with this. And uh, I think it will take some time before society helps them out. So I don't know if it's Andrew Yang's, you know, giveaways, universal basic income. I don't know if it's that. Uh, that was quite before its time, but something will have to step into the fray of what artificial intelligence is going to do to our world of work. And Shannon, that brings me to the end of my presentation. I don't know if we have time for questions or any questions uh, in that regard, but I'd be happy to take some. We do have a couple questions that came in. So um, where do you think surveillance capitalism stands in 2045? Surveillance capitalism? Hmm. I think there's, I think it's just going to be, there's going to be cameras, uh, you know, everywhere uh, upon us watching our every move. Um, and I and, and it sounds bad. That, that all sounds like oh gosh, I don't I don't want that. We're, we're working into that right now. We're just not aware, as aware of it as we should be. So I think that um, I showed you some of the some of how Google interprets uh, the images, how driverless cars interpret the images that it encounters, uh, and so on. 
And, uh, you know, we're just going to be part of that. We are going to be part of those images that are going to be, uh, you know, seen on the camera. And it's going to both help us and hurt. It's going to hurt us in the sense of kind of hurting us, H-E-R-D, hurting us into certain things. But I think being on camera all the time means that some of our former bad behavior is going to be more normative behavior. I won't get into specifics, but some things that we do uh, maybe that um, today we wouldn't want, you know, we wouldn't want everybody to see us doing out there on the street or whatever. Um, everybody's going to be, you know, on camera doing this. And so it, we're going to be changing our ethics, changing our normative standards as a part of that in order to adapt to that new world. We're, we're going to have to. Uh, that I'm afraid brings us to the top of the hour. That's all that we have time slotted for today's presentation. William, thank you so much for this very insightful uh, presentation. And thanks to all of our attendees for engaging in everything that we do. We just love it. Um, just to let you know, I will send a follow-up email to everybody with links to the slides, links to the recording uh, by end of day Monday for this. So thanks, everybody. I hope you have a great day and stay safe out there. Thanks, William. Bye-bye.